Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is the man, the myth, the Seattle legend himself, Mr. Christopher Knapper. Hello, sir. Welcome to Adam versus the man. Good morning, gentlemen. How's it going? Outstanding. Thanks for joining us, Chris. I appreciate you stepping up to have this conversation <laughs> like this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Well, hey, is it, there's a little muffling on your audio. Can you adjust that, or is that the best we can do right now? Um... Take a look at some things here. Hey, you sound you're Lima Charlie on my end, Chris. Okay, then forget it. It's then we'll we'll just go ahead if it's my end. So, Chris, um, you know, the the basic concept of uh, dissolving the federal government for me is is about localization, right? Let's get government down to the community level or the individual level where any grouping is by choice. No one's forced into any system. Uh, against their will. And if, if you're going to say, no, people have to be forced into a system, then in order to, to back up, you know, that we need the federal government, you have to say, it should happen at this scale, right? At this exact scale, not, well, like, you know, a lot of the arguments that, that you hear from other Bernie Sanders supporters might be, well, therefore, well, yeah, I don't have a problem with going to global government. Well, then you have to justify it on that. Uh, but the basic premise of, of libertarianism that's behind this concept for me is the the ethics of self-ownership and thinking about policy-wise, how do we get to a world uh, where ethics are respected as, as quickly as possible? And for the things that the federal government does that are good, and I, I'm not, you know, a, a delusional absolutist who would say it achieves nothing positive, but that all the things that it does achieve that are good or worthwhile uh, are fundamentally achieved in a coercive system that would be better achieved in a voluntary ethical system. So this is where I I half agree with you and I half disagree. And to be honest, I feel a little bit weird being the guy here to defend the federal government because <laughs> I'm not going to say I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> yeah. That's it's a pretty, it's a pretty crappy, awkward position to have to take. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not typically that guy. Um, it's obviously a very flawed, not a fan of the oligarchy that we have right now. Um, that being said, um, one thing that I personally um, very much benefit from is the ADA laws. I'm disabled, I'm in a wheelchair, I have muscular dystrophy. Um, and we just last month celebrated 30 years of the ADA being in effect which is a huge achievement for people like me in our situations. Uh, it's provided tons of uh, equal access and equality for, for people with disabilities. My concern is that without that federal protection, people like me would be open to lots of discrimination. Uh, like I said, this law is younger than I am. And... Um, before that law, there was so much inaccessibility, like public schools. People like me may not have been given access to education. We would not be given access to public buildings for employment. And uh, I mean, there's just so much discrimination without these laws. Um, you know, before the ADA, the states could have done these things. They didn't. Um, so I find it hard to put my faith in the fact that one, every state would enact some sort of version of the ADA, especially when it comes to the fact that the ADA and disability rights aren't exactly the same as say other civil rights. You know, most most civil rights, be it for your ethnicity or your sexual orientation, or whatever, most of that just involves leaving people alone. Like, don't bother them because of that. Let them just exist. Disability laws cost money. It costs money to make a building accessible. It costs money to install elevators, um, things like that. It all costs money that, you know, taxes need to be distributed for. When it comes down to, like, the states, um, 
states don't want to like, increase their taxes to pay for these things, especially when it only benefits a small minority of the population, what a lot of people aren't even aware of. You know, you might go to a, an accessible business every day and never even realize that it's you know, discriminatory towards people with disabilities. So it's hard to advocate for something that a lot of people aren't even aware of. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very interested to hear how well, you yeah, think hey, that plays out. Hey, yeah, man, I'm, I'm happy to give you the time to get to the next topic and, and, and you know, get into this a little deeper. But let me, you gave me a lot to address there. So if yeah, I may so. first say, yeah, you know, when, when you look at how America treats people with disabilities and different challenges, uh, you know, like, like what you describe and in your case, it's a mixed bag. And it's really hard to look at what we're doing and say that we're living up to our potential here. And I say that about a lot of things in, in terms of, you know, how is America performing? And this is one of those areas where it is especially tragic that we don't do as well as we are capable of. And, and I look at, you know, uh, taking care of veterans like myself with PTSD, uh, you know, military veteran suicide, homelessness, uh, you know, you know, some of these areas of, you know, obvious, you know, broad human challenges where you go, we, we really could be stepping up to meet these challenges. And we're not. And one of the things that pisses me off most about this is how, despite being one of the greatest hindrances to the American society, community, family, however you want to see us, nation as a whole, taking care of people who need that help in those ways, uh, despite being the biggest hindrance, government still somehow manages to take credit. And it is, it is really a sad distortion of reality. So to address what you said first about the ADA, uh, I understand that the Americans with Disability Act uh, has done a lot of things that are really positive in improving access and that you can look at the encouragement for businesses uh, as, as a positive thing, but what is that encouragement? What, what form does it take? It's coercion. You know, it's fundamentally unethical to, to, to go to a business owner and say, if you don't do this, we are going to deny you your right to do business. And I could look at this just from the ADA impact on term, uh, in terms of accessibility, but if you look at giving government the ability to do that, the overall effect is horrific in how much it holds us back from our economic potential in so many other ways, providing better services, better medical treatment, medical advancement. All I mean, we just saw, and I'm sorry, a bit of a sidebar here, but if you don't, if you don't believe the, you know, violent nature of this, you know, what does it mean when the government says you can't do business? There was a, a company doing a vitamin C treatment that got raided like a meth lab last week because they said that it might help with corona. And, you, and you know, so for the ADA, the defense of, of businesses here is for some businesses, the application of the ADA re requirements are just absolutely irrelevant and create an unnecessary cost that creates an economic burden that might, you know, put them out of business. It might make a business not viable. It might just increase the cost of customers and just be, you know, a little economic inefficiency. And you might say, hey, that's not a big deal, right? Hey, it's not, it's, it, it's better that we have you know every business forced into some accessibility code than to to you know and, and have some inefficiency but that inefficiency you know you might say hey one business had to spend an extra thousand dollars well how many wheelchairs for people in need is can you buy with a thousand dollars how many upgrades how many how many other services can you actually provide to people with disabilities with those resources that are being misallocated because of government force and so I'd like to see a more compassionate response rather than a forced response. And I think that the, the, the American people are naturally compassionate. And it, it might be. And if, if you want to make the case that the ADA pushed people in, in, into creating more accessibility sooner than they would have otherwise, and that somehow out, outweighs uh, the costs of that. You know, in that in that one instance, yeah, that's kind of a subjective analysis. If you want to take that position, I'd give you that point. 
But I think if you look at the overall effect of giving government the power to address that, has and and then lie to us and take credit for stuff they don't deserve credit for, has has really made the situation worse overall for people with disabilities in this country. I I agree. I think it's idealistic to think that just general compassion will solve these accessibility issues. Uh, kind of like I said before, like these problems were so predominant before the ADA and there was nothing stopping people from being compassionate then but they just weren't whether that be a lack of financial means to solve these issues or be it just that they're unaware or uncaring of these issues um whatever the cause may be those problems were very predominant so this is where, to me, it's if you want to say it's compassion versus violence, you know, you're saying that because compassion failed to get other people to do what you want them to do, you're willing to use the violence of government. I, so I have I way would, more faith in compassion and more patience for it. See, what I would like to see is, I think the biggest failing of the ADA is the fact that it's not funded. Um, there isn't uh, government funding to support these ADA implementations. So um, I, th- this is where I would support a voluntary effort. And if, it, if, if charities came together and said, we're going to raise money for this, we're going to pay for businesses to become more accessible by ADA standards, I would 100% support that as a voluntary, compassionate option. Yes, I, I know historically and traditionally, Compassion doesn't get the job done. I, I've seen it. I think history shows that. Oh man, compassion doesn't get the job done. I mean, the, the, the world makes the world go around, before. man. I hate to sound like the hippie here, but yeah, like, the compassion and 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 desire to 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 better ourselves and our friends and families and communities is. I mean, I, you want to look at it through that angle one of the primary motivators of human behavior. And I think well, to, where, was to that compassion compassion, the, where was that compassion before the ADA? I think it was manifest in plenty of other ways to just say, and to say that there was, uh, so here's another thing I want to give the ADA credit for. When you say, where's the compassion? I think you're looking at it through an unnecessarily narrow lens. But if the ADA sort of brought raised awareness to, to, to that extent, I, I totally support it in, in, in that one dimension of its effect that if you want to say before the ADA, you know, the compassion that is a natural part of human nature was not sufficiently directed to uh, access for uh, disabled Americans. And the ADA brought attention to that. And, you know, that's great. Don't wave a gun in your face when you're waving a good idea in people's face. You know, and, and come with compassion instead of coercion, and you're going to have a better effect, if not immediately, certainly for the long run, because that coercion always comes with unintended consequences. Well, even today, I mean, even with the ADA and the current awareness that it's brought, there's still tons of businesses, even public federal buildings, sidewalks that are inaccessible. Um, right. All these things remain inaccessible. 30 years after this law was passed. And again, even compassion and the law is still not enough for people to make things accessible until they get sued. So um, one way the or another, threat of saying... lawsuits is essentially the only thing that seems to get people to make their businesses and uh, even, like I said, public spaces accessible. Well, I, thank you for making my point for me, Chris, and that the law in and of itself has failed in many ways. But you could look at that and you have, to, you have to analyze this with logic and reason and not confuse correlation and causation and, or, or make assumptions, because it could be that the law has actually held back progress if you don't think it's at the point where it could or should be at this point. But, Chris, to, if, if, if I may, and, and feel free to go back to this if you feel like we haven't addressed it enough. But to the, to the core topic of the federal government and the question of where should this happen? See, I don't have a problem with the community getting together and setting a standard and saying, if you choose to be part of our community, 
we're going to expect that you follow these standards of compassion or of accessibility or charity in our community. But at what level, like if, if that's not the system you're advocating for, would we be better off with the United Nations passing an ADA standard and then forcing it on, you know, on, on you know, some guy in a mud hut on the side of the road in, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, selling produce just to, to keep his family alive? And, and do we do we do we impose those standards on them? Or should it happen, you know, at the federal level where it only is in a nation where we have this unique ability? Or does it go down to the states or go down to the local level? You said earlier that you don't have confidence in states enacting a similar law, but you've already said that the federal law has been ineffective. So why would you have well, faith in the federal government and not a community? I would say the federal law has been the most effective we've had so far. Um, it still needs work. There's still improvement that can be made, but it's by far the biggest and best step we've taken as far as making our world, our country more accessible. Um, well, see, again, this is, Chris, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but I think this is represents a really important misunderstanding of reality. If you look at government action in a bubble, and this is, what, again, what really I find disturbing is that government is taking credit for stuff that they don't deserve credit for. If you look at the, F, uh, the ADA based on its impact, you say, well, of all the laws, it's had the most impact in this exact dimension. But if you look at what everything America has done over throughout American history in compassion and charity and accommodating people with disabilities, it's insignificant. The, what, what government is getting you to look at is this tiny, tiny, tiny aspect of this much bigger issue uh, of compassion in America to, towards people with disabilities. And, and by that, you go, wow, there's so much more here. And, and I, I, mean, I mean, let me ask you, do, you, do you really think that the changes enacted as a result of the ADA in any way measure up to everything else that America has done over its entire history to show compassion to people with disabilities? I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question there. Uh, so, but, so go ahead. The impact of the law, just the ADA, versus everything else that America has done over its history to show compassion towards people with disabilities. Um, yeah, I think the ADA still, as of right now, is the biggest step we've taken. Um, more than every charity program, more than every wheelchair every, ever made, oh, yeah. more than every dose of medicine delivered, more than all the medical care, more than everything that people have done to, in their in their own lives to take care of family members who are disabled all of that you think that is smaller than the regulatory impact of the ada in the last 30 years in terms of building accessibility as far as the broad scope yeah um in a in more individual like narrow scope yeah you know like i personally benefit from my wheelchair manufacturer whatever um, but like that doesn't help a blind person. Um, the ADA kind of has helped disabled people as a whole bigger. Um, okay, so, so, so you say that, that that doesn't help blind people, and the ADA has specific things for blind people. Well, you could apply yeah. the same logic before the ADA. You know, there was um, a, 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 I don't want to sound cliche and try to make bad jokes about all the blind amazing blind performers and and you know uh people we've had in american culture but uh blind people were not like cast out on the streets to die before the ada and then the ada came along and oh now they're able to live like well you, you know, know it's, it, it's interesting to bring that up because uh pre-ada like earlier in the kind of pre-world war ii era there was states had like essentially forced eugenics and forced like sterilization uh, laws on the books that were yeah. specifically targeted towards people with disabilities. Yeah, um, that was the state. Yeah, I that very much worries me. If we go to this being a state's issue, that we go back to that, 
I mean, I look at the world right now, even with the ADA and our current, you know, post-World War II, I did eugenics and everything, but we have the disabled community, there's this big, like, kind of idea that people are better off being dead than being disabled, uh, which us yeah. in our community push back against heavily, obviously. Uh, but you have, like, when it comes to, like, right to die laws and things like that, which I'm not exactly against in certain situations, but it's such a, like, I, you know, like you said, I hate to use a cliche term, but it's a very slippery slope where if you get yeah. a doctor that believes in this whole, like, better off dead than disabled idea, he starts pushing this, um, you know, right to die issue for people with disabilities that maybe they just need some counseling or maybe they need better accessibility. Maybe they need a better home care. Uh, there are better solutions than just killing themselves. Um, Absolutely. And do you even look at like Hollywood movies, like what we see in TV and movies and media, most any time a disabled character is portrayed, it's as the object of pity or, um, yeah. again, do you like the million dollar baby movie or, um, but some better meat, me than the but uh, whatever that movie was. Yeah, um, hey, I'm, it's always with the disabled person dying. Hey, and <laughs> with, with mental health, with personality, yeah. mental health disabilities, yeah. the stigma and the discrimination and the uh, dehumanization uh, of of patients is even worse. I want to mm-hmm. go back to the point you made about state states in the past doing these mm-hmm. horrific things with eugenics. Mm-hmm. Because I look at that and go, yeah, that's the slippery slope you should be looking out for, is that if you give government an inch, they're going to take a mile. If you give government that power, like you look at this and, and, and go, well, we, you looked at a government problem and said, I need more bigger government to protect me from the smaller government. And what you end up with is more bigger problems, the more you empower people to solve problems with violence and coercion as opposed to holding the line of ethics and saying, no, no matter what the problem is, you have to address it peacefully, violent, excuse me, peacefully, cooperatively, nonviolently, unless you have, you know, an immediate threat where you're using uh, violence or coercion in a defensive way. And so I, I would say that, that it, it, again, it's, it's really sad that you saw this institution do this evil thing and you turn to that same institution to correct it as opposed to looking for nonviolent alternatives. And, and Chris, um, I, I hope this has been you know, a, a satisfactory, at least initial exploration of these issues from this angle for you. I know there's way more to this and way more to get into. But I'm do you have it? It, sorry, I didn't mean to touch you off. No, no, go ahead. Just, do, you have, do you have any final thoughts you want to share or specific questions you want to ask me before we go? Well, I would like to know what non-violent or coercive whatever solutions you think are practical that would provide the same type of protection that these federal laws have provided me. What do you mean by protection exactly? Protection from discrimination. Well, to provide me the same equal access rights that I have now. Well, I think the government is the biggest denier of your rights fundamentally, uh, whether you're disabled or not. So, uh, you know, in terms of protecting you from discrimination, uh, I think the best means of accountability is public awareness. That's what's ultimately going to change the actual decision making that people who would be in a position to discriminate against you are going to uh, are, are going to apply in making that decision. You can introduce government threats into that, and that's really going to influence their decisions as well. But forcing someone to do something doesn't change hearts and minds, doesn't change fundamental attitudes, doesn't actually raise the level of compassion. And I think raising awareness, raising compassion is really going to be a lot better than threatening people with that. And when people are discriminating, uh, even then, I don't think, I mean, if if it's government and it's like they're stealing from everybody to provide a public service, 
that that's a different challenge. That's, that there's a different problem there. But when there's no force involved, I don't think introducing force makes the situation any better. So when a business is engaging in unjust discrimination, I mean, I, again, the term discrimination uh, is a is a very loaded one, right? Does does a Hooters have a right to discriminate against men applying to be servers there? I, I think they do. You know, so when you say just all discrimination is bad and you don't use that term with a little more finer understanding, I think it's easy to just, you know, use it like racism and, you know, discrimination is, is, is a very imprecise term. But when they're engaging in something that is inappropriate, that is be, be beneath our capacity or community's demand for compassion to support a business, calling them out, addressing it, supporting businesses that actually are in line with your values supporting charities that are in line with raising awareness of what you want awareness to be raised on and, and actually direct resources to help people as opposed to go to a government program that's going to be inherently corrupt and have fraud, waste, and abuse. I think those are all way better ways that as a society we can raise the level of compassion for how we uh, address the challenge of, uh, of disabilities in our society. Yeah, I, I wish that, I wish I had more confidence in that. But history has shown me that that just isn't enough. Um, people, it's hard enough just to get them to be aware of accessibility issues. Most people aren't. And if they aren't even aware of it, they don't care enough to invest the money it takes to make things accessible. Uh, so people said, I, people said the same true. thing about slavery. You know, when, when, when in America people were considering abolishing slavery, they said, well, history has shown us that no society has ever survived without slavery. And the people who are against slavery said it doesn't matter. Slavery is wrong. It has to end. Violence against peaceful people is wrong. And it has to end. That's what slavery we're didn't today. end until the federal government mandated it. Ah, we are the only country in the world that required a civil war to end slavery. Every other country on earth, more or less, and certainly without a civil war on the scale of the United States, was able to transition out of slavery peacefully. All the things that we're dependent on government for today, I will certainly acknowledge the reality of our current dependence. But that does not in any way dissuade me, the historical argument. I do believe that you're looking at a very distorted government narrative of history to begin with, but nothing in that history even would dissuade me from saying that we can do better, we must do better, we have to do better, and the way we do better is not by embracing an old unethical system, but by embracing a new, higher standard of ethics based around individual rights and self-ownership. Yeah. <laughs> Hard to argue with in those terms, Chris. I know it's been a lot of food for thought, a lot of stuff to absorb and process. Very few people who, when they're challenged with these ideas uh, or, or they get any kind of major challenge to their paradigm, are able to incorporate and reprocess and, are, and adjust their paradigm in the course of a conversation. You've been very open-minded in absorbing all of this, and, and I hope that we can have a follow-up conversation Maybe when, when you've had a chance to to really fully weigh and if you come back to me and say, No, Adam, I don't want to talk again, my paradigm is unshaken <laughs> by anything you have told me. Hey, that's cool too. And I would I would appreciate hearing from you on that. But yeah, I'm uh, happy, Chris, to, happy to talk anytime. Um yeah, I respectfully disagree. But uh I and I I say that wishing that I believed what you believe. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today, Chris. Hey, CJ, thank you for setting this up. Any last thoughts, CJ? Yeah. So you you obviously wanted me to kind of moderate. So I figured I'd come in at, at the end here. And I wanted to just, uh, I'm going to do this for Chris because he's my friend. Uh, please go to snappyclothing.com. Yes, please. And check out, this, this is, this is uh, just one of the shirts that uh, Chris has designed. And uh, I, I absolutely think he's got some awesome clothing out there. So you know, just if you can uh, feel free, definitely got some cool things that you will not see anywhere else, especially if you're in the Seattle area. 
Um, so uh, real quick, gentlemen, before I let uh, Chris go here, I want to say that I, out of most people in the world, probably enjoyed this conversation the most. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so uh, so th uh, thank you, Chris, for doing this and Adam for taking this interview. And uh, I do think that this is something that as we go through humanity's beautiful dance forward, I think that we should have more conversations like this where concerns are, are brought legitimately. And Chris, you brought a legitimate argument. And Adam, I think you've responded in, in a very libertarian way. So uh, honestly, I can't, I can say that I can see both points of the argument and I'm not taking anything from anyone. I just think that as these concerns get brought forward, we have to actually have the correct answer. And so again, I'm probably the guy that enjoyed this the most. So thanks, Chris and Adam, for doing this. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I enjoyed the conversation.